Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Parallel C++. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about false sharing. So one of the things that we have to watch out for whenever we're writing parallel applications is the performance effects of cache coherence. So cache coherence is just a mechanism within our processor uh, that makes sure that everyone sees the same updates to a given piece of memory. So whenever we want to write to a given piece of memory, uh, we want to make sure that no one else can still read an old stale copy of that. So if we're doing a write, uh, what this means is we first have to invalidate everyone else's copy of that piece of memory before we can go ahead and do that write. Now, this can have some interesting performance implications, right? This means that if we have multiple different threads that are accessing the same piece of memory, they're going to be fighting over that memory, and that piece of memory is going to be invalidated and bouncing around uh, between the different caches um, and the different cores of our processors in parallel applications. Now, it can also have some surprising performance impacts when we're using uh, different pieces of memory that happen to be close to each other. And that gets into this topic of false sharing. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So to go ahead and start off with, we'll go ahead and set kind of a baseline for our experiments with a serial implementation of a very simple benchmark here. So we'll go ahead and start by opening up this zero, uh, zero serial.cpp. And what we have in here is just a simple work loop that we're going to run on a single thread. So all this work loop is going to do is increment some atomic integer, this counter, for 2 to the 27 total iterations here, right? So for 2 to the 27 iterations, it's just going to do this atomic increment of this counter. And we'll go ahead and spawn this thread. Now for our second benchmark that we're going to look at, we're going to look at a case of direct sharing. So we're going to add some parallelism to example. So instead of just spawning a single thread, we're going to spawn four threads, right? And these four threads are each going to take one quarter of these total increments, right? So what we're going to see here is now we're going to have four different threads fighting over this same piece of memory, this counter. So whenever one of these threads wants to do an atomic increment, it's going to first have to invalidate everyone else's uh, you know, copy of this counter, right? Um, then it does its increment, and then say another thread's gonna come along on say a different core and invalidate the you know copy of this counter um, from the other thread or for the other thread. So we're just gonna have some fighting over this counter here. So we would expect our performance to be a whole heck of a lot worse in this case. So let's go ahead and measure that, right? So we'll go ahead and quit out of here and we'll compile both this serial and this direct sharing uh, benchmark here. So we'll go ahead and compile our serial benchmark, right, with O3 optimizations and linking its libp thread, and also the C20 standard here. So we'll go ahead and compile this, and we'll also compile um, our direct sharing uh, benchmark with the exact same um, flags here. So O3, libp thread, and standard equals C20. So let's see the performance difference between the serial and this direct sharing implementation. So we can first just say time, our serial implementation, and we can see that it runs in about half a second. So, you know, 0 0.53, 0 0.54 seconds total. Now what happens when we time our uh, direct sharing example here? What we see is it takes a whole heck of a lot longer, somewhere on the order of 2.2 .2 to 2.4 seconds uh, total. And this is coming from that direct sharing and this contention over our single uh, performance counter that multiple threads are trying to update. So this counter keeps getting invalidated by these different threads that are all trying to write to this exact same piece of memory. So there's a couple ways that we can observe this in a bit greater detail. So one thing we can do is we can observe this uh, from the level of, you know, the performance counters that track um, our cache misses. So um, if we have a cache miss, that means, um, you know, the data that we tried to access wasn't inside of our cache, right? So we had to fetch it from someplace else. So when we have a high degree of contention like this, we should see a lot of cache misses. So we can do perf stat dash D and rerun our application here to get some performance counters. So we can go ahead and run that on our direct sharing benchmark. And what we see is that we have, you know, quite a few L1 data cache misses here. So 17 or over 17% of our accesses to our L1 data cache 
ended up being misses. And that's because we have these four different threads fighting over this counter, right? We can compare this to our serial implementation. So we can do perf stat dash D on, you know, our serial benchmark. And we see that only 0 0.03 of our L1 data cache loads. So when we're trying to read memory, we see that only 0.03% of these accesses were misses by comparison. So, you know, we have way fewer cache misses here. Another way that we can kind of observe this effect of this contention is with perf C2C or perf cache to cache. So what we can do is perf uh, C2C record, and we can run our direct sharing uh, benchmark again. Uh, go ahead and fix this. And then we can, after, you know, this go ahead and goes ahead and completes, we can do perf C2C report. And what we see is we have this shared data cache line table here with just a single entry in it in this case that's sorted by the total number of these hit M events. Now these hit M events means that we found a cache line that was in the modified state in another cache. So the modified state is just one of these cache coherent state that says that we were trying to do a write to this cache line. So if we have a large number of these hit M events, that means we're consistently finding uh, this cache line in the modified state, meaning that um, you know we're consistently writing to something on this cache line over and over. And it's a good way to measure to see if we have contention. If we're writing to a cache line over and over, um, there's a good chance that you know we're going to have a performance problem here because um, writes send out these invalidations to any of the other copies of this cache line that exist in other caches. So we can see the address of our cache line that's being accessed here, uh, things like the number of these hit M events that we're seeing. And we can even, you know, do, uh, you know, press D to get more details on this particular cache line. And what we see is, you know, the exact offset in the cache line that we're accessing. So this is just going to be, um, you know, for this particular cache line, right, that's sitting at this address, we're accessing this hex 24 offset. So that's where our counter is living that we're accessing. And if we even scroll to the right, you can see, you know, exactly kind of where we're accessing this inside of our source. So it's from our Lambda that's being run from our std thread here, right? Inside of our direct sharing uh, executable here from direct sharing.cpp. Okay, so that's a couple different ways that we can kind of observe these these you know effects of contention here. We can look at the you know number of cache misses we have, and then we can find contention or look at contention through something like perf C2C. Okay, so what we've looked at so far is just a serial example, and then a case where we have direct sharing. So let's move on to this false sharing example. So you may have been wondering, you know, you know, what can we possibly do to um, you know, avoid this problem having this contention here over the single counter. So one thing we might decide to do instead is to have uh, multiple counters, right? So give every single thread its own counter, that way they can do a partial sum, right? Um, or, you know, you know, partial, you know, handle, we'll say one quarter of these increments themselves, right, in kind of isolation. And then we'll just combine all of those partial results at the very end. So that's exactly what we've implemented here. So instead of just having a single counter, we'll create an array of these pseudatomic ints, right? So we'll create four counters here, all initialized to zero, one for each of our threads. And each thread will inc increment, again, one quarter uh, of these total iterations here. And then inside of our actual work loop here, every single one of our thread is going to increment its own counter based on its thread ID. So a thread ID 0, 1, 2, or 3. And at the very end, it'll go ahead and you know increment this final sum here to get our final result. So we're still getting the final result at the very end, you know, the result of incrementing um, all of these counters, you know, 2 to the 27 total times, right? So we're just accumulating those partial results here into this final sum. So hopefully this should have better performance instead of accessing the same piece of memory, we're most often just accessing our own unique uh, pseudatomic int here. The only time we're accessing the exact same piece of memory is when we're accumulating this final sum here, but that should be only four total accesses, right? Accumulating the results from these four total threads. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, quit out of here and let's see how this false sharing benchmark fair, uh, uh, compared to our serial and direct sharing implementations. So we can go ahead and compile 
uh, this false sharing that CPP with the exact same flags. So O3 LP thread and std equals C plus plus 20. So we can compile this and we can start off by just timing it. Right? And what we see is we get an execution time that's almost identical to direct sharing here. So even though we had four different counters now, so each of our threads is incrementing its own counter for most of the iterations, we're getting the same effect as if we were um, you know, incrementing the exact same counter. So why exactly is this the case? So we can start by doing some investigation here. So we can first look at say some performance counters. So we can do perf stat dash D and run our direct sharing uh, or rather our false sharing executable. And what we see is just like our direct sharing example, we have a high number of these L1 data cache misses here. So 20% in this case. So we're seeing a high, uh, so for a, a large number of iterations here, uh, we're missing inside of our cache when we're trying to access our counter, even though we have unique counters. So, so that seems kind of odd. So another way that we can dig some more into this problem is again by using perf C2C or perf cache to cache. So we can use perf c2c record and we can run uh, false sharing and then we can do perf c2c report right to generate that report and then we see we have a you know an entry in this shared data cache line table for one cache line here so what exactly is going on here so let's go ahead and look at more detail here and now we see we have four different parts of the same cache line that we're accessing so for this cache line, you know, hex 7FF D9Z0 7FC840, we're accessing at an offset of 20, an offset of 24, of 28, and 2C. So each of these entries is four bytes apart. These are actually our four counters. They're being stored continuously in memory in that, um, in that std array, right? And it just so happens that they all fall on the exact same cache line, right? Cache lines in many modern processors tend to be 64 bits, maybe 128 bits, or rather bytes, uh, depending on your processor. So either 64 bytes or 128 bytes is pretty common. So we're accessing four different parts of the exact same cache line. So, so this is where our uh, contention is coming from, right? In this false sharing case. So cache coherence, is maintained at the granularity of a cache line. We don't main, maintain a cache coherency state for individual bytes. We do it at a higher level of granularity, the granularity of a cache line. So every say 64 bytes or 128 bytes. Now what this means is that if we access or try to do a write to one part of a cache line, we invalidate the entire cache line, right? In everybody else's cache. So it didn't really matter in this case that we separated our um, you know, counters out into four different uh, pieces of memory because those four pieces of memory wound up on the same cache line. So when any of the threads tried to update their own unique counter, they incidentally invalidated everyone else's counter as well. And this is what we call false sharing. So we don't actually have any direct sharing of any piece of memory right across our different threads, but we're incidentally sharing the same cache lines, right? So we're sharing the same cache coherence state, which can lead to these kinds of performance problems. It looks exactly as if from a performance perspective, we were accessing the exact same counter. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we can maybe alleviate this problem here with our final example here. And that's going to be this no sharing example. So we have pretty much the exact same example, right? Two to the 27 iterations spread across four threads, except this time, instead of just using a normal std atomic int, we're going to wrap our std atomic int inside of a struct that we'll call aligned atomic. So what we'll do is we'll add this align as 64 to our std atomic int counter here. And all this really says is that we want our std atomic integer here, right, for our struct to only be able to be placed at addresses uh, that are a multiple of 64, right? So every 64 bytes, we can have uh, an atomic integer here, or rather this aligned atomic type, right? An object of this aligned atomic type. So what we're essentially do is adding some padding between, um, you know, our different atomic integers. So if we create four aligned atomics, they'll be spaced out 64 bytes away from each other each. 
And that will help make sure that they all wind up on a unique cache line, right? They can only be placed, right, with this alignment of 64 bytes. So we make sure that they can't be placed right next to each other because our cache line size tends to be 64 bytes. But you might have to look it up for your particular processor. It might be something like, um, you know, 128 or maybe in some rare cases, something like 32 bytes. Okay, so let's see the rest of our implementation here. We see that it's almost identical to our false sharing implementation. All we've done is swap out our std atomic int um, for this aligned atomic, right, for our counters. We're updating our unique counter still, right, but now they're separated by 64 bytes each, so they won't be on the same cache line. And then, you know, we're still spawning our four threads as normal. So let's go ahead and see what happens, right, when we compile and run this example. So we'll compile our no sharing.cpp with the exact same flags, right? O3 libp thread and std equals C20. And we can go ahead and start by timing this, right? So we can time this no sharing. And what we see is we finally have a performance improvement here with our parallelism. So now, you know, we're actually seeing that, you know, roughly 4x improvement in performance compared to our serial implementation. So we're doing all of these increments in around, you know, 1.4 seconds compared to, you know, if we run our serial benchmark again, you know, somewhere on the order of, you know, 0.53 uh, seconds total here. And that's because we finally got rid of these, you know, cache misses that were coming from um, our cache coherence and the false sharing that we had in this false sharing example. Okay, so that's going to be a bit on false sharing. It's one of these things we have to think about whenever we're dividing up our memory and partitioning our memory between our different threads, right? Things can wind up on the same cache line. So from a performance perspective, it can look like they're being shared, right, between different threads. And we can see some contention for the same cache lines. Now, that's going to go ahead and do it for this time. As always, you can find this or any of my other examples at github.com slash coffee before arch. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.